Good afternoon. On behalf of the YWCA staff and board of directors, I want to warmly welcome you to our inaugural Power Lunch speaker series. My name is Catherine O'Neill and I am the CEO for YWCA Edmonton, located in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Before I begin, I want to respectfully acknowledge that YWCA Edmonton is located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Saltoy, Anishit Abe, Inuit, and many others who have, whose histories, languages, and culture continue to influence our vibrant community. YWCA Edmonton has been proudly serving and empowering women and families in our community for 113 years. Through world wars, the Spanish flu, and many other trying times, we've always been there with a helping hand. So COVID-19 has been no different. We are hard at work helping vulnerable women and families in our community get through this crisis and ensure that important women's voices are at every decision-making table during this unprecedented time. So the Power Lunch is part of our COVID-19 response plan. While we have to physically distance right now, we still need to gather even virtually to celebrate amazing women and discuss powerful ideas. So thank you for joining us today. We have more than two, oh, close to 270 participants joining us from all over the world, including several members of parliament and uh, local municipal dignitaries from across Alberta. Over the next three months, our power series is going to feature Canadian women that we think you should get to know, including educators, women's rights advocates, award-winning journalists, and diplomats. Today, we welcome Jacqueline O'Neill, Canada's very first ambassador for women, peace, and security. Her presentation will be followed by a Q&A. We are also joined today by two moderators, YWCA Edmonton board members, Megan Klein and Francesca Alcusain. Megan is the executive director of the Edmonton Mennonite Center for Newcomers. She also serves as the YWC Edmonton president. And Francesca is an articling student with field law in Edmonton. She recently completed her law studies at the University of Alberta, at, sorry, the University of Ottawa, where she interned with the Department of Justice and the National Association for Women in Law. So with that, please grab your lunch and prepare to be inspired. Francesca and Megan, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, so first I'll take everyone through our plan for the presentation, uh, and then I'll briefly introduce our speaker for today. So uh, as mentioned, the presentation will be divided in two parts. Uh, first, uh, for the first 30 minutes or so, we'll um, have Jackie explain her role as ambassador and why it matters, how she ended up in that role, and sort of more general conversation for us to uh, get to know her better. And the second part of the presentation will be the Q&A portion. Now for that, if you look at the uh, bar at the bottom of your Zoom window, in addition to the usual chat function, you'll see a Q&A box. Uh, that is where we ask that you submit your questions. Uh, we wanna avoid putting questions in the chat as much as possible. That'll just help us keep track of all your questions and um, get as many of them answered as possible. Uh, you'll notice that there's an upvote option as well. So if you like a question that someone else has asked, uh, you can upvote it and that will ensure that the most popular questions get answered first. You don't have to wait to submit your questions. You can do that as we go. Uh, we have Megan monitoring the Q&A box on an ongoing basis. Uh, also, Jack, Jackie has kindly agreed to answer questions in French or English. Donc, si vous avez des questions en français, vous pouvez les poser aussi. Uh, and uh, the last housekeeping item uh, that I'll add is that whenever someone references a document or a page, a uh, bio, you will find all those links in the chat. Uh, that is also where you will find the uh, YWCA handles on social media so you can engage with us and each other. Uh, and when you do, make sure to use the hashtag 
YW Power, Power Lunch and we are YW and tag us so we can see and share your posts. Uh, we are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Okay, now without further ado, I'll introduce our inaugural speaker, Jacqueline O'Neill, who is Canada's very first ambassador for women, peace, and security. She has spent years advocating for women's meaningful inclusion in peace negotiations, national political dialogues, and policymaking. She has worked with the United Nations and a number of governments and coalitions of women around the world to advance women's full participation in the resolution of conflict and has in many ways forged the field of women, peace and security. Jackie, thanks so much again for being with us today. We are thrilled to have you. Thank you, Francesca. Shall I get started? Sure. Uh, so. Jackie, you currently work in Ottawa, but you're an Edmontonian and you went to the University mm -hmm. of Alberta. So I'm curious, uh, what role did Edmonton play in your journey to your current job? Okay, thank you. Uh, well, and thanks to you, Francesca. Hi, Megan. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, thanks to everybody who joined and a big welcome from Ottawa. I really, I'll just start by saying I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to talk to Albertans about this issue. And in fact, I probably shouldn't tell you that because I'm a Canadian public service and I'm supposed to serve all Canadians equally. But I have to say that I start almost every event or big meeting here or anywhere else saying, you know, is anybody here from Alberta? And I'm always so happy when someone raises their hand because, you know, we are everywhere at embassies, at refugee camps, and working for businesses, anywhere you find Canadians. Uh, and I'm really, or Albertans, I'm really happy to do that. Now, um, some people do tell me that they're from Calgary, so I publicly accept them, but deep down, I know it would be suspicious. And I think we have a few on the line. I'm very grateful because uh, outside, I make sure that we have a unified Alberta front. Uh, so as you mentioned, Francesca, I'm from Edmonton. I actually grew up in St. Albert. I had uh, one of my first jobs as a teenager at the West Edmonton Mall. I worked in the hologram store, for those who remember when that was a thing. You said I went to the University of Alberta and I worked a little bit in management consulting in Edmonton. I must say I never actually made peace with the winters there. Um, and I was always very curious about other parts of the world and was very eager to travel. And I was especially curious about the lives of women in other parts of the world and especially about the different ways that women were leaders. And so I'd see exhibits at Heritage Days or in our great Alberta museums or read whatever I could and I was just straight curious. And of course, I was very lucky to have tremendous role models in Alberta in leadership growing up um, all around me, not least my own mother, Mary O'Neill, who I think is on this call today from St. Albert and who's always been really involved in the community. So I ended up living a little bit in Chile, in South America, in Ottawa, in Sudan, in Africa, and then in Washington, D.C. for about 15 years. Uh, where I was based there, but I traveled regularly to Africa, Latin America, Asia, the Middle East, et cetera, always working with women community leaders and trying to change the policies and practices of governments and bodies like the UN. And uh, I'll just say, you know, you asked how you ended up in Edmonton, from Edmonton doing a lot of this work. And I'll say that being from Alberta brought a lot of things about Canada into perspective for me. So. On the one hand, it really helped me see clearly some of the challenges that we need to address at home. One of the most pressing being that, of course, First Nations, Métis and Inuit women in Canada continue to play a really heavy price of living at the nexus of colonialism, racism and sexism. And we have to come to terms with the historical impacts of patriarchal and sexist policies that resulted in a number of ongoing issues, including the tragedy of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Uh, and so it's also reminded me that, you know, as, as we talk with governments around the world, we have to be willing to undertake the same kind of self-reflection that we're asking of them. But being a Canadian living abroad also really helped me recognize many of the spectacular things that make Canada so great. Uh, and that I think are really useful and needed in the world right now. And that includes, you know, an understanding of the value of diversity, not just sort of accepting that it exists. Um, it means uh, having generally positive attitudes towards immigration and appreciation of the contributions of immigrants. 
means being and having a commitment to multilateralism. So understanding that we, we can't and we shouldn't do things alone. So we have to have rules and systems for working together. It means a commitment to universal health care, uh, especially acute and important at the moment. And it means a lot of policies and attitudes on gender equality. So, you know, I'm not naive. I know we're not perfect, but nowhere is. And we have a lot of really positives to build on. So I just feel extremely lucky that I now get to be in my dream job where I get to be part of the government and to work on this from the inside, even if it's uh, from Ottawa and not from Alberta. Thank you. Um, and now I'll, I'll admit that when I first read about the National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security, I was a little mystified as to what that entailed exactly. Um, so in your own words, how would you explain the concept behind the Women, Peace and Security portfolio? Got it. You're not the only one, Francesca, who reads it and uh, for whom it's not immediately apparent or, or evident because it's a term of art. And so term of art, uh, terms of art can mean different things. I'll start by saying what it's not. So it's not something that is just by women for women. So it relates to peace and security for everyone. It relates to men and to boys and people who don't identify with one gender. And it's also not putting forward the idea that women are inherently more peaceful than men. What it is, is the idea that the best policies, or the most effective ones, result when the people who are most directly affected by them are meaningfully involved in shaping them. And there's you know, a term in a lot of communities, the idea, nothing about us without us. That's the basis of women, peace, and security. Also the thinking that decisions about war and peace and everything that makes up your sense of security have to include women in them. And for too long, women have been wholly excluded from official processes to prevent or to end uh, or to rebuild after violent conflict. So I'll tell you the brief story of its origins because I think another myth that exists is that this is an idea that came out of the West or the global North, so to speak. Uh, and so about 25 years ago, about 40,000 women came together in Beijing for the World Congress on Women. I know there are a lot of YWCA representatives there. And there were many who came from countries that were dealing with war. So Rwanda, Colombia, Bosnia, the Philippines, many, many others. And they found that even though they had very different cultures, they had very similar experiences during the war. So they kept essential services going. Some of them fought as combatants. They called for an end to the war. Some of them mediated, some of them got parties to the table. And then when it was time for an official negotiation or formal reconstruction, they were almost entirely shut out. And so they decided this is just wrong. It's a violation of their rights. And it's also ineffective. So they organized for many years. And the result was that they got the highest security focus body in the United Nations, the UN Security Council, to pass a resolution saying women are not only victims of conflict, but they have to be involved in decision makers and that we have to be intentional about making that happen. And so we passed, the Security Council passed a resolution in the year 2000, which I'll note was the last time that Canada officially sat on the council. And it was led by Namibia and it had support from Bangladesh and Jamaica. And that was where the term women, peace and security was born. So very briefly, you know, you might be saying, okay, that was 20 years ago. Do we still need this now? I'm gonna do a little pop quiz. Uh, some of you can um, just think of your answer, or you can write it right in the chat. Uh, but just to give you a sense of scale, as we all know, women are roughly half the population. We looked at, and the studies have done this, an analysis of all major peace processes from 1992 to 2018, so about 25 years. How many women signed those peace agreements? So how many of the people who signed them at the end of the negotiation that determine big steps of the future of the country were women. See some numbers coming up. The answer is 4%. Half the population, 4% of signatories. So it's a really, really stark underrepresentation. And there's a whole lot of evidence now that women's participation matters. And it's not just to women and girls, it's a whole community. A big study came out uh, recently that found that peace agreements were about 35% more likely to last at least 15 years if women participated meaningfully in their creation. So we know that when women are involved, it leads to more sustainable agreements. 
And there are a lot of reasons for that. And I think I saw earlier, uh, Senator Mobina Jaffer was on this call and I'm gonna steal a story of hers that she tells to, to illustrate this point. So she was in, um, she was in, uh, she was Canada's special envoy to Sudan several years ago uh, when there were peace negotiations around Darfur. And I'm gonna make this, story, this long story really brief, but essentially what happened was that uh, the agreement or the negotiations happened outside of Darfur. And what often happens, or what happened is what often happens is that the UN brought together rebel leaders who had been living in exile. So living in Europe, living in other parts of Africa, et cetera. They all sat down in Abuja and Nigeria and they were negotiating different agreements. And because Mobina is Mobina, Canadian envoy, she said, we need to have women as part of this conversation. And if we can bring these warlords here, we can bring some women. So she got the UN to pick up a number of women from various refugee camps who came and they served as an advisory group. So they uh, gave parties input on the negotiations or feedback on draft, uh, draft terms, et cetera, what should be covered. And at one point, uh, as Mobina describes, the negotiations like ground to a halt and people couldn't agree on, what, on this one specific issue. There was big impasse, negotiations can go forward. And so the women kind of came into the room, they weren't allowed in the specific negotiating room. They came in and they said, well, what's, what's the issue? And people pointed at a map and they said, you know, we're deadlocked over who gets control of this river. And the women pointed at the map and they said, this river, this river right here on the map. They said, yeah, we can't, we're at an impasse. We can't agree who, who has control. And the women said, women who are living in the camps and who have been collecting water as is their like practice to do for women to do. The women said, this river dried up about three years ago. So why are we fighting on it? So that's just a brief example to show that, you know, it's not saying women are again or more peaceful or otherwise than men. It's saying that you need a whole community's perspective to weigh into the issues that affect the whole community. And we have now lots of evidence that women, you know, expand negotiations beyond just how to divide up resources or who gets which ministry, where the border lies but they do things like fight for integrated education as they did in Northern Ireland or police power in Guatemala or in Colombia for land rights, all kinds of things. And, you know, I've even had women say to me, we were in drafts uh, looking at national constitutions. Well, it's me, the constitution of our country. And if I hadn't been there, there would have been text in the constitution that said the president, he shall so-and-so and his powers will be and you know, a little thing even like changing the pronoun of the president is enshrined in writing forever can, as we know, affect both how young men and women uh, see their perspective. So this relates to peace negotiations, climate change, artificial intelligence, migration, everything. The idea that women, peace and security is that women have important perspectives on those and we have to be deliberate. Sorry, Wonderful, thank you so much for this exhaustive explanation. Um, <laughs> I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure this helped uh, uh, many of our audience out there. Um, so now that we know on a high level what the concept of women, peace and security is, uh, could you talk about what is involved in your day-to-day -day work? Uh, what does your job entail in practice? When we were chatting earlier, you said that um, I, I work for the government, but I'm not a politician. Is that is that a, a common thing <laughs> that people think? Sure. Yeah, I definitely have an unusual job even for the government. So it's unusual to be an ambassador to a concept and not to a place is unusual. And to be a Canadian ambassador that's based in Canada, not based somewhere abroad is also unusual. Um, but the, the idea behind my job is basically to make sure that the Canadian government is building thinking about women, peace and security into everything that we do. So I mentioned there are 84 countries now that have these national action plans that you raise. And the, the national action plan is a way at the country level to bring alive those resolutions that women fought to have passed at the United Nations. So Canada has one. And I think it's really important to emphasize that in Canada, this concept has had support from multiple parties. So the first national action plan that we had uh, was in 2011 under a conservative government. The second one that's in place now is under a liberal government. We've had NDP members of parliament who voted to create my position. Uh, it's had a lot of support from you know, all, all parts of parliament in the past. And something that's unique about Canada's 
National Action Plan, which I'm uh, helping to implement, is that it doesn't only look abroad or it doesn't only look domestically. It's something that combines both. So our National Action Plan has uh, eight implementing partners plus one imp implementing agency. So that's the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. So it's led by Global Affairs Canada, essentially Foreign Affairs, Department of Defense, the police, but it also has domestic departments, including immigration, justice, uh, public safety, and very, very importantly, obviously, found Indigenous Northern Affairs and Indigenous Services Canada, recognizing that the stuff that I was just talking about is obviously not only a challenge elsewhere, it's a challenge at home. So I think of my role as basically like a force multiplier to try to help people across all of those eight departments in one agency to basically mainstream this thinking. So working with Canadians uh, to identify ways we can uh, work with local women to, be, to have their voices heard, what tools, what training we get as governments, how do we work with our counterparts, what are we raising, what initiatives are we leading at a global level, at the UN, at NATO, at elsewhere. And it also means normally a lot of travel to go support uh, the work that our embassies and a lot of women around the world are leading. Obviously, uh, slightly different. I think the best way to... <laughs> Sounds good. Um, I wonder, um, in light of recent events, uh, how has your job been impacted by uh, COVID-19? Well, there's certainly a lot of travel that's not happening uh, these days. So I'm doing a lot of Zoom meetings and a lot of calls like this, a lot of emails. Uh, and what we're trying to do in the short term is hear from women around the world what they're facing what they're experiencing. And uh, we're getting quite a lot of messages back and maybe I can tell you if, if it's of interest a little bit of the, some, of the, some, some of the things that we're hearing uh, about how this work is evolving kind of globally. So, you know, a lot of women who focus on issues of peace and security are in the same boat, I would probably guess that the YWCA is in and various others in that you're pivoting and you're trying to be responsive to what the community needs. And so many are pivoting to be focused on COVID response itself. So doing public awareness campaigns uh, about health practices, talking about how the virus is transmitted, why to wear masks, et cetera. So a lot are consumed with the urgency. Um, a lot are fighting misinformation, which is a huge, huge challenge, of course. Um, colleagues in Myanmar have talked about, uh, for example, in, in the Rakhine state, where there are uh, large communities of Rohingya in Myanmar, the internet is still cut off. So can you imagine dealing with COVID response while there's actually no access to the internet. Um, you know, women everywhere are also dealing with massive spikes in domestic violence as we're seeing here in Canada and, you know, many, many countries where we're working uh, rates have doubled at least of domestic violence and women and women's organizations are trying to get accessible services uh, and also trying to make uh, attention to that part of the government's response plan. Uh, the UN has called for a global ceasefire, so has called for you know, a global halt uh, in fighting, and there's been varied responses to that, but a lot of women are advocating for that, including in really uh, local contexts. A lot of women are focused on calling for the release of prisoners, uh, recognizing just horrific conditions in prisoner prisons, and the fact that a lot of people in prison, including women, are there because they've been human rights defenders or are effectively political prisoners. So it's a huge priority for a lot of Syrian women that we're working with, uh, same uh, for a lot of women in Afghanistan. The majority of women who are incarcerated in Afghanistan, for example, are there for nonviolent crimes, and at least half of them have been charged with so-called moral crimes, meaning uh, having sex outside of marriage or failing virginity tests, et cetera. So, they're calling for uh, a release of prisoners of that nature. And we're also hearing a lot about uh, worries of exploitation of the crisis by governments or armed groups. So, you know, Colombia, for example, uh, the first day that the lockdown went into effect, a well-known human rights defender was assassinated in her home. That's because her attackers knew where she would be. Uh, women talk about, for example, in, in Yemen, uh, in who 
anti controlled areas. A lot of uh, women have been fighting for a long time to keep open spaces where women gather, like beauty salons or women's tailors. And those were the first places to be closed when the lockdown was announced. And you know, a lot of women's organizations have experiences or have recollection of, for example, the Ebola crisis. So there's a ton that we need to study from that crisis, which has not been uh, recognized nearly in the same way that it needs to be. Uh, but one that's all, a stat that just strikes me so powerfully um, relates to women fighting for the fact that we still need to keep our focus on what were priorities before and not have this COVID tunnel vision. Uh, and they cite a stat, you know, in, in Sierra Leone, during the time of the Ebola crisis, mm -hmm. the healthcare system was so disrupted and many women were so fearful of seeking healthcare that it resulted in 3,600 maternal and neonatal deaths, so over 3,600 deaths. And that's about the same number of people who died directly from Ebola in that country. So we have to make sure that we're considering you know, what impacts all kinds of programs have on women. And to wrap up, I also wanna just say that one of the things that we're focused on or that I'm thinking about in my job is not just the negative consequences of this crisis, but also, you know, I think the term is getting a bit overused now, but how do we build back, back better? What can we actually change uh, for the positive out of this? And there are a few things that I want to flag and we can maybe discuss some of them and get others input. But, you know, the biggest one, the concept of women, peace and security is in part about the fact that we need a broader understanding of what security is. It's not just tanks and guns that keep us safe. It's communities that have access to healthcare and childcare and all kinds of resilience, factors of resilience, communities that are less um, unequal. So a modified understanding maybe of what security actually is and then some spending that aligns with that is, is key. I think we're also seeing changes in appreciation of data that is disaggregated by sex. So looking at, for example, mortality rates, men actually die at greater rates when they have COVID, but women are much more likely to contract COVID. Why is that? What are the sectors that they're working in? Are there biological factors? What are the effects of inequality on who is getting COVID and how are they managing with it? If you're working paycheck to paycheck, you're more likely to take risks that expose you to COVID. How do we factor that in our national response? How does even you know, a stay-at-home order affect men, women, boys, girls, non-binary people differently? I think we're also recognizing that domestic violence is a massive problem. The UN is now calling it a shadow pandemic and doesn't affect, of course, all women differently, it affects indigenous women, racialized women, women at different income levels, et cetera. And then the last thing I'll note, and I think uh, this relates to something, some things that we all care about, is you know, imagine if we used this crisis to value women's labor differently. Uh, there's a good friend of mine who advises the UN Secretary General, and she says our formal economy is only possible because it's basically subsidized by women's unpaid work. And so we have, as she says, almost this black box over the home and everything that happens in it that has this zero dollar value on it, and that's not sustainable. So if we're looking at that, we're looking at community-led organizations and how connected they are to communities and how valuable they are. Uh, and I think we need to be reflecting during this time also about how we can uh, ensure that our response to COVID addresses both immediate needs, but then it also deals with some of the systematic challenges that people have been raising for a long time and ensuring that we don't uh, sacrifice progress on those bigger issues as we're looking at the short term. Long answer again. Thanks, Francesca. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jackie. No, there is uh, there is so much to uh, to pick apart from from what you just said, and so I am eager to hear our audience questions. Um, so that brings us to the second portion of our presentation, uh, which is your questions. And uh, on that note, I'll turn the virtual mic over to Megan. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, there are some really great questions in uh, the Q&A and, and please keep them coming. Hopefully we will have an opportunity to answer all of them. If we don't, we will find ways to get information to you and resources to you. So um, there's two pieces in the response you just gave, Jackie, that I think tie into questions that are already coming through in the Q&A. One that relates to uh, the goals of you know, women, peace and security 
during and post COVID and the other one relating to data and how we are actually using data. So I'll start with uh, the, the first one that came up in our feed here from uh, uh, Mobina Jaffer, thank you. What happens to women, peace and security goals during the COVID crisis? And how do we keep Canadians and our government engaged? Okay, well, Mobina probably could answer this better than I can, uh, being a Senate, a current senator uh, and a trailblazer in this work. Um, so what happens to women, peace and security goals? They stay the same. They are the goals of inclusion and participation. And I think what women above all are advocating for is for their voices to be heard. I always hate the term for women to have a voice. They have a voice, sometimes we just ignore it. Sometimes we don't give them space to organize so that they can uh, frame their voice, we, et cetera. But for the vo voices to be heard. And I think um, you know what we're seeing with respect to COVID is a lot of national responses that are uh, not necessarily informed by women uh, directly. And so one of the things that we see in addition to women providing direct services in communities, but is trying to ensure that they are at the table deciding what is going to happen. So for example, in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, I think there are something like 12 women foreign ministers and 13 women uh, ministers of health, for example. Yet there are like 45, 75 or 45 countries. So 48, I think. So um, a lot of women are talking about how do we make sure that we are involved in the conversations to ensure that these different types of analyses are applied to the solutions that are being drafted. As for how we keep it in uh, our government's lens, I think that's, uh, that's part of my job is to ensure that we don't, as I say, make sure that or enable this kind of COVID tunnel vision that is a risk as we're also consumed with it and make sure that we're consistently coming back to some of the structural problems that led to some of the um, most acutely negative responses in the first place, both at home and abroad. So the next question I'll segue into is, is with respect to data. Uh, so when I was looking at the UN Women page on the focus for women, peace and security, there were six priority action areas to accelerate progress. And the very first of those was improved data and gender analysis to make leadership accountable. How would you say that's being rolled out? And I'll specifically look to uh, Marcy Harnick's question here. Marcy is an equity, diversity, and inclusion expert. She's asking, do you use GBA plus, gender-based analysis plus uh, work? No, I'm reading this wrong. Do you use GBA plus <laughs> to work? And uh, she's referencing the National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security. Okay, so GBA plus, gender-based analysis plus, is something that is extremely close to my heart, and I can't tell you how happy I am that someone raised it. So just for those who aren't steeped in this uh, government bureaucracy, gender-based analysis plus is a tool for decision-making and analysis that the government uh, of Canada and, and some provincial governments have been using for over 25 years. It's not a, a new thing. It's been growing in, in importance. Basically, it's a tool for looking at how a policy or a program or an initiative might be affected by people differently and might have different effects on people. And the plus, which is extremely important, is going beyond just whether, for example, you're a woman or a man or a boy or a girl, but to look at all kinds of factors that affect your identity. So are you a higher income bracket or a lower? Are you urban? Are you rural? Are you uh, racialized in some way? Are you, uh, is your sexual orientation different from the majority? All kinds of factors that contribute to how you might access a service or something like that. And the answer is yes. Canada has been doing gender-based analysis on a whole bunch of things, including COVID responses. And it's been, I, I think this is the moment for GBA Plus to shine. I think this is one of the things that Canada has and does that is both needed by the world and is a massive contribution to the way that policies globally are made. And so one of the many things that we've been trying to do in this period from our, from our homes is share examples of gender-based analysis. And that goes for everything like 
reconstruction and uh, rebuilding efforts domestically. So if we prioritize supporting, for example, a construction industry versus the service industry, neither one is in inherently better or worse, but they have different implications for men, for women, for people in different parts of the country, et cetera. So we have to have eyes wide open in those. Uh, and so when we talk about data, I think a lot of people default to just counting women and something that we're trying to do through our national action plan and through, uh, through other approaches is to say, yes, we need to have women at the table. We need to have women directly involved. But we have to go way beyond that and looking at, you know, which women do we have? Do we have women representing a whole diversity? perspectives? Do we have uh, people who bring different voices? And are they, is that translating into policies? And so not just saying, well, a woman was there, that's fine, but does that actually result in, in things that uh, result in better policies or different practices? You know, I often cite um, in a way that GBA Plus was applied by the RCMP in Alberta, actually. Um, a couple years ago, they were finding that they weren't having enough, they were just struggling to recruit women into the RCMP. And uh, they were, you know, they were trying to figure out why, was it the messages, et cetera. And they did a gender-based analysis on the entire recruitment process. And one of the things they found was, they identified, was that they did the recruitment process uh, where you could apply once per year and you could apply in September. And everyone with young kids in particular, men and women, know that September is probably the worst time of year for uh, a parent with young kids you got back to school, you got all kinds of activities starting up, et cetera. And so that was impacting the number of applications they got from women who are often primary caregivers and also from parents, from younger men who had families. Uh, so they changed the application process to be rolling and that resulted in something like 12% increase uh, of recruitment of women specifically over a year. So that's an example of what gender-based analysis plus is. Again, it's not saying women are more important or less important or better at something. It's just saying we have to unpack our processes, which relates to the data, which relates to not just counting women, but looking at the whole. That's great. And for those of you unfamiliar with GBA Plus, type it into your Google search engine and you can become certified in GBA Plus. It takes a couple of hours, but it's just, it's a worthwhile refresher. I found, I thought, I know this information, and I still really enjoyed going through the process, and there were pieces of it that I didn't know. So um, it's a really great tool that we have as Canadians. Well, I guess anyone can, <laughs> can log on and, and use this. So I'm going to keep with the data uh, piece a little bit. Uh, we have a question here from Kim Kelly. She's asking about quotas. So um, uh, verbatim here, are quotas used within the government? For example, membership on committees to address the underrepresentation of minority groups. And so she's asking furthermore about what kind of metrics uh, are being evaluated at the leadership level to look at diversity and inclusion. And are these metrics transparent to the public? Okay, uh, let me uh, unpack that a little bit. Thank you, Kim. Uh, so in terms of quotas, um, com on committees, I, I can't speak to parliamentary committees. I don't believe that there are any uh, quotas that are in place, either at the party level or uh, legislated. Uh, but I, and so I think it's primarily up to parties of who they place on uh, on committees. So people can, um, can talk about that um, if anyone wants to correct me in the, in the chat. Um, but in terms of uh, quotas overall, I can speak primarily internationally uh, and say that, you know, this is, and, and then I'll get to the metrics point, I'll say the quotas overall are, uh, are still a somewhat uh, discussed, uh, debated issue and people have different perspectives on, on them. Um, I'm personally in favor of quotas as a short term measure and short term can sometimes be several years or even a generation. And the reason I say that is that, um, you know, we're, we're trying to compensate for historical challenges and historical discrimination, quite frankly. And I've seen a lot of instances where uh, a quote has been applied and it's meant as a jumpstart. So for example, I did a lot of work in Sudan and worked with women parliamentarians there. And after the peace agreement was reached, they, uh, women fought very hard to have a 25% 
quota for women in the National Assembly. And a lot of people were saying, especially in the international, primarily in the international community, we're saying it's not culturally appropriate for women to do this. We are women don't have the history, et cetera. And women said, no. Um, first of all, not every male member of parliament who's sitting in that legislature is qualified to the highest degree. We, we know our communities, we have uh, the knowledge we need and we need to be there. And over several years, you started to see the difference uh, that it made to have women in parliament. So for example, they created the first all party caucus. The Women's Caucus was the only caucus in the National Assembly that had all parties represented in it. When you're emerging from a war and trying to create a transitional government, I mean, it was hugely, hugely important. They did things like getting a women's bathroom built in the National Assembly. So women who came later all of a sudden had infrastructure uh, created. And, you know, most of, they raised a whole range of policy issues that were very important, uh, but there, they also were an example for young men and women in the Sudanese community to see this is the world of governing. And what was very frustrating is that there were a lot of people that I would hear say, well, you know, the quota has been in place for four years and they haven't done anything, or a lot of the people in place are re related to the senior leader of something, something. And, you know, I think four years is a short amount of time. We saw the same thing in, in Iraq with people saying, well, what, what effect was the quota? And these things, take a lot of time. So government perspective on a, on a quota obviously varies by place, but it's not a blanket kind of yes or no perspective. And quite often in draft constitutions or things we argue for elsewhere, uh, we will advocate for quotas as a temporary interim solution. And in terms of metrics, uh, they are, uh, all the metrics that the government of Canada uses are public. So even in, in the latest budget, uh, some of the metrics used to assess uh, the extent of funding for different priorities, et cetera, they're all published and they're, you know, they're now all on the government websites that these different metrics are available. And as I said before, they definitely are going from, are moving beyond, and this is a challenge for people everywhere to move beyond just counting women, but to look at funding and resources, to look at other systems that encourage women to participate, uh, and then to look at the policies and results that emerge from that. So it's a, it's an art, uh, not as much a science at this stage, but that's really the state of the art of metrics on this. And I think Canada is doing a lot of great work uh, with support from members of all parties in the parliament. Thank you. So uh, a couple of the other questions that have come forward are about the support that you're getting in your role and the reception uh, for this role. It is new and uh, perhaps you know, like if we started off this talk talking about the clarity of what it is you do, it might be opaque even to your peers. So are you getting the support you need? What kind of reception are you having with, uh, with other ministries and other departments? Yeah, it's been great. I mean, it, it's been great. Uh, generally, people are very, very supportive of extra capacity is how I describe it. So as I say, I'm trying to be like a force multiplier for the government. What I'm trying to do is find, especially where there are good things happening and there's, uh, there are people that are trying to move specific initiatives forward and saying, uh, how can I help? How can I use the title of ambassador, which you know, I still giggle a little bit inside when people say, oh, Madam Ambassador, excuse me, Ambassador. Um, it's so, you know, it's, I, I've learned to embrace the fact that having that title can open doors or can uh, lend a sense of importance to a meeting or something like that and to, and to really exploit that, or as my colleague would say, leverage that. Um, and have gotten a lot of really positive feedback from other departments and other parts of the government. I think the vast majority of the civil service and of our politicians in Canada really want to create smart policies and they want to be useful and, and responsive to what people in communities want. And I'm trying to help do that. So that's, that's been very positively received. I'd say, um, you know, internationally, it's very much the same thing. Focusing on uh, women and girls, talking about feminism now has become, I think, a, a key part of Canada's brand internationally. And so many of the people I work with kind of know to expect that we will raise it or that we'll talk about it, something I'm very proud of always extremely careful to uh, never appear to be lecturing or anything like that. I think it's, as, as I talked about before, it's 
really important that we frame this as Canada doesn't have everything figured out uh, and we're certainly not perfect and so we share a lot. I always make sure that we share a lot of the challenges that we have and then that we talk a lot about some of the shared goals that we have. And I, I'd say you know, in my office I've basically banned the term uh, like-minded. So in, in government we also often talk about like-minded countries or like-minded institutions and I think that, that's changed a lot and one of the biggest uh, challenges that we can have when talking about gender equality is to make assumptions about which countries are supportive and, and which governments are supportive and which aren't. And you know I think for example of Ethiopia right now they've got 50% women in parliament, they have a minister Ministry of Peace, as well as the Ministry of Defense, both of them are headed by women at the moment. Um, when we talk about who is like-minded and who is supporting us, we find a lot of allies in what traditionally might be unexpected places. So within government, it's, it's been uh, quite open, and then internationally, there's a real movement, I'd say, behind us, and it's fun to, to go out and meet a lot of people in different places who are working on this, and that real excitement for me comes when uh, you meet people in communities, at local governments, at a municipal level, anywhere, who are working on things like this, and, they, and you can kind of talk about the shared challenges and excitement that you have about the issue uh, and really help advance that. That's, that's where the fire comes to me, and that I'm missing these days in many ways. Well, one of the things that does interest me about this role is it is not focused externally or internally, but you are spanning uh, both of those realms. So uh, one of the questions we have here from uh, somebody who is obviously involved in immigration, but I have no name. How can the Women, Peace and Security agenda be steered to meet immediate needs of marginalized women in Canada as well as abroad? And with it, that particular focus on intersectionality. So, as we said, the concept relates everywhere. It's not a foreign concept, a domestic one only, et cetera. It relates everywhere. And it's a term that we're increasingly using domestically, but it also is coupled with a lot of work that goes on uh, already at home. So for example, Canada now has the Women and Gender Equality, a full government department de dedicated to issues on this front. The other thing, a lot of conversations that we've had and, and have taken place over many years, including before I started, is with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit women about intersections of women, peace, and security uh, in their communities. And for example, how many of the calls to action from the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls report overlap with some of the priorities of the work that we do, for example, abroad. So what have we learned uh, about things related to domestic violence, about training police, about concepts of security, about corrections facilities, about vulnerability to incarceration, about understanding the risks that people in different communities face. I think we have a ton to learn from the calls to justice from that report that are relevant at home, that are roughly you know, under this umbrella of women, peace and security, but are also being worked on and have been worked on for many, many years uh, by women in other communities. So you know, how do we make sure it's intersectional? How do, how do we make sure we account for the fact that different women experience these policies differently? We just have to continue to talk to different women. You have to be deliberate about it. You have to recognize that that you have to have to have to have this dimension of your analysis and then you have to ask people directly. I think one of the biggest things I've learned in life is to always be suspicious of anyone who purports to talk for someone else. And I think you know a lot of the um, a lot of the resistance early on on this work came from people saying it's not culturally appropriate to do this here. It's not cult this is not culturally appropriate. And I think in every community, in every part of the world, including in Canada, there are women who want to say in the decisions that affect their lives. And that when people tell you that either a group is uniform or that you don't need to be consulting further, et cetera, it's usually people who don't want to be held accountable by their own constituents, by their own people, and are trying to hold on to power. And so cultures change, culture needs to be respected. It seems this approach that you use has to be informed by culture, but um, you know we can't let anyone 
kind of purport, as I say, to speak for an entire group uh, without uh, engaging people differently. And, and the way that we do that varies. So, you know, I've learned things from the time of day that you hold meetings, the way that you uh, advertise people, whether you have a meeting or not. Do you have meetings with men and women together? Do you have women together first? Do you have meetings within a community and then have someone from outside come? There's all kinds of different tactics that you need to use. But the essence is that we still need to be engaging people directly in every decision that affects their lives. Yeah, that's so true. Um, I think you know the issue of holding on to power is is really critical and difficult waters to navigate in your role. I'm sure. Um, I remember my mother went uh, her comment when she went to the UN Women's Summit in New York a number of years ago. She sat there listening to all of these proposals, simple changes to policy that seemed like a no-brainer. That was her word, and they were all turned down because that's not our culture, and that's not a good enough reason. <laughs> um, I have. You have to ask always who defines culture, right? Who's who's saying what culture? Is what and who do you let? Yes, I know that. that the votes were made by men. The policies were proposed by women. So, um, I have time for one more question before we wrap this up. Uh, this was on my question list, but I'm glad to know somebody else asked it in the Q and A. So, thank you, Marcy. What can <laughs> we do here as attendees to support this work to amplify uh, the the issues and the message that's going out, um, let us know how we can get involved. Thank you. I always love this question. I have learned to always bring the group in to respond to this question. So we have a chat function and I know that there are a lot of people on this call who are working on initiatives that need input. So I encourage people to write in the chat what you can do. A couple of thoughts for me directly. I mean, first, Engage with the Y, the YWCA, uh, community-based women-led organizations are always going to be directly or connected to communities. Uh, they always need financial support and they will always need time and resources of uh, volunteers. So whatever local organization it is that matters, I think it's important to engage. Uh, writing to your politicians, your members of council, your members of the legislative assembly, members of parliament, uh, you know, I think they like to hear when things are going well. They like to hear what's important to you. If you want gender-based analysis done on all kinds of things, write them and tell them that you're paying attention to that, that it matters, that you want to see it. And then a couple of things I always cite, uh, if I speak with students or, or teachers or professors, I say something that you can do in your house today is do an audit of your curriculum. You know, if you're in a university course, for example, if you're teaching something, look at your reading list and how many female authors do you have? How many female guest speakers do you have? How many are racialized Canadians? How many represent vulnerable groups of different kinds? How many have disabilities? How many, you know, start asking these questions. And I think often we find that we are recycling or we're getting recycled materials that aren't as uh, representing the diverse perspectives we can. Even if you're at home and you're reading the newspaper every day, and you're reading articles, do they have voices of women? Are they not just talking about women, but are they citing women experts? Are they interviewing women who've been affected by it? And if not, write to the write letters to the editors. Um, really demand that you have different voices that are informing your worldview, and I, I think that results in a very different engagement with the world. So I'd say uh, those to start, but I hope others are contributing on chat. Thank you. I do see uh, something in the comments from Elizabeth Gray saying that uh, the GBA plus analysis and the lens is sadly lacking in Alberta's response to the COVID-19 crisis. And I felt the same. I wrote a letter to my MLA and I am sorry to say I have not received a response yet, but I think the more of us that write, the more of us that use our voice, the better. Thank you everyone for your questions. I know there's a couple of questions that I didn't get to in the Q&A, but um, I'm going to turn this over to Catherine to close us out and hopefully we'll be able to get you some materials to answer any questions that are left lingering. Thank you so much, Megan. And thank you, Francesca, for helping moderate what has been a thought-provoking, honest, and 
you know, powerful conversation um, led by Jackie. So again, thank you to you. Thank you, Jackie, for your work. It is incredible. It's inspiring. Um, I'm sure that there's a lot of people on this call today that are going to really be excited to help you and, and help organizations in the community continue what, you've, what you're helping to do. So thank you for your work. No. Again, you've been listening to the Power Lunch speaker series. It's our very first one. We're very proud of it at the YWCA. It's a chance for us to gather folks virtually during this, this pandemic to continue the conversation about important topics and spotlighting really incredible Canadian women doing amazing work to make our world a better place. We have four more speakers lined up. Uh, the next speaker is Kelly Keene. She's a personal finance educator, award-winning author. She's lined up for June 9th. So check our website and our social media channels in the coming week to sign up. We also will be featuring YWCA CEO, Maya Roy, Tanya Talega, an award-winning uh, author and activist, and Casey Matchin, who is the Co she is the co-founder of Parity Yay. So please check our website for more information. And if you like what you've seen, please donate or get involved with the YWCA Edmonton. We welcome you. Uh, we need your help. And again, thank you for joining us today. Uh, stay well, stay, stay safe, and see you next time.